الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن اهتداهم بهديه واقتدى بسنته إلى يوم الدين وبعد My dear respected honorable listeners, I greet you with the greetings of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, we have completed Surah Al-Lahab. And inshallah, we will commence with Surah Al-Ikhlas today. Inshallah, Ustaz Shu'ib, I believe, will be taken through the tafsir. Inshallah, I will start with the, with the tajweed session. And inshallah, we'll go through the common mistakes verse by verse, inshallah. So I'll do mashq first once and then we'll go through the common mistakes. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem Bismillahir rahmanir rahim Qul huwa allahu ahad الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد. So in the first verse, the first letter is a big calf. You know, a lot of people they change this big calf into a small calf and they read it cool. But here the calf is a big calf and Recite it with the big qaf and not a small qaf. In the second word, in the third word, Allah, this Allah here is a full, is a full mouth Allah. The lamb here is a full mouth Allah. Why? Because the word Allah before it, the word huwa, the wow has a fatha on top. So when we see the word Allah, we look at the letter before the word Allah. And if it's got a fatha, a dhabr, or a dhamma, pesh, then we have to read the word Allah with a full mouth. And if the letter before the word Allah has a there a kasara, then we read the word Allah with an empty mouth. So in this case, the Allah will be full mouth. So qul huwa Allahu ahad. The ha here is from the middle of the throat. It's a big ha. There are two types of ha. There's a big ha and there's a small ha. The big ha comes from the middle of the throat and the small ha comes from the bottom of the throat. Now there are six letters of the throat. Hamza ha, ain ha and ghain kha. Now ha, the big ha, small ha and kha, if you make a slight change in where they come from, so one comes from the top of the throat, one comes from the middle and one comes from the bottom, then you have changed the letter, you have changed the letter completely. For example, in this word Ahad, you come from the middle of the throat. Now, if you go a bit more down to the bottom of the throat, you've made it into a small ha, ahad. And if you go too high, then ahad. You've changed the word completely. So in this case, ahad, this ha is a big ha, and you come from the middle of the throat. Ul huwallahu and the huwa, the second word huwa, that ha comes from the bottom of the throat. So ul huwallahu ahad. The second verse. Allahu Samad. So this Allah is also a full mouth. Why? Because the word Allah, the lamb, the, the lamb in Allah before that, the alif has a fatha on top. So we read this Allah with a full mouth. And then you join it with the word as Samad. Allahu Samad. And the swad here is a swad, not a scene. A lot of people make this common mistake of reading it with a scene. Also, this swad is a full mouth letter. So it's not swamad and it's not samad, rather it's swamad. So, swad, so it's not a scene and it's a full mouth. Allahu Samad. And when we um, when we um, end on this verse, Allahu Samad, then the last letter, the dal, we change the pesh into a sakin. And whenever we change, whenever we see a dal with a sakin or we're changing uh, and make a dal into a sakin, then we do a little echo sound. Also in the first verse, if you were to say, Qul Wallahu Ahad, and stop there, then you need to do a little echo sound also in the second verse. So Allah Samad. The third verse, Lam Yalid Walam Yulad. The common mistake is very simple. Lam Yalid Walam Yulad. The dal here, Lam Yalid, this dal here, it's already got a sakin. It's not been changed into a sakin, but it's already got a sakin. So we need to do a we need to do echo always. Lam Yalid. 
So you don't you don't just stop there. Lam yad. You don't make it into a complete sakin. Lam yalid. And you don't make it. You don't make. You don't do too much of an echo where you make it into a fatha. Lam yalid. But you make a slight echo sound. Lam yalid. And also, walam yulad here also, the dal is already a sakin. It's not been changed into a sakin. So this needs to always be read with a echo. So, lam yalid, walam yulad. And the last verse, walam yakullahu kufu wan ahad. Walam yakullahu, this kaf in yakun is a small kaf. Walam yakullahu, this is a small kaf and not a big kaf. And the hu from lahu, walam yakullahu, needs to be stretched for one alif because it's uh, ultra page or in English you can say an upside down page so it needs to be stretched for one alif walam yakullahu kufu wan ahad now the wow with the tanween here we need to make it apparent because the rule that takes place here is an idhar after the tanween the letter hamza comes and idhar takes place and it's hard make it means to make something apparent so we need to recite the tanween properly walam yakullahu kufu wan ahad don't do too much where you're reading it like an ikhfa or a gunna kufu wan ahad not so less where you can't even hear the tanwin walam yakullahu kufu wan ahad rather you need to make it more apparent walam yakullahu kufu wan ahad and also the ahad here as well same as the first verse the ha is from the middle of the throat and because we're going to stop here most definitely the dal needs to be changed into a sakin therefore we need to do qalqala echo inshallah Inshallah, I'll do mashqa one more time, inshallah. <clears throat> Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Allahu samad. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. Wa lam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad. Sadaqallahu al-azim. والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Before I go on, can I just ask if uh, my video is clear and the audio is clear as well? الحمد لله today is better okay. Yes, yes الحمد لله <laughs> Unanimous acceptance here so um <clears throat> okay subhanallah this is a very powerful surah and it is a very deep surah and to be honest uh, there is only so much i can say about this surah it's just uh, I, I can't do this surah justice but i will try my best and if Allah accepts it, then he accepts it. And if not, then I need to work on that. But this surah is a very, very strong surah. And it is so strong that the Prophet wasallam said in one hadith that if you read surah ikhlas, once it is like reading a third of the Quran. So if you read it three times, it is like doing a khatam. You get the reward of doing a khatam. This is how strong the surah is. You could say that this surah is the peak of what the uh, is trying to display, demonstrate for us. So the surah is um, it, it pretty much encapsulates all everything that Islam is, or you could say um, the main part of that. And that is to do with the oneness of Allah. It is all about the oneness of Allah and his, his, how he is free from all of creation. Everything that you can even think of, everything that you can even imagine, Allah is still beyond that. Doesn't matter how far you can go, doesn't matter how deeply you can think, Allah is always beyond what you can understand. And the, and the only way to recognize him is through pure inspiration 
okay? And one way of, you know, pure inspiration is through the Qur'an. So it starts off, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد Say, He is Allah, the one, the alone. And before, before uh, I carry on, the, this is found quite often in the Quran where it says قل before the verse. Okay. So the first verse is mentioned throughout the Quran. And so on. And so on. Um, this phrase, they say that the, the wording itself. It is just Allah saying to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, say this, meaning he's saying to him, say, Hu Allahu Ahad. But because of how much the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wanted to preserve the purity of the message that he tries to record every single thing that Allah sends to him in revelation, he even adds the word qul into it. <laughs> SubhanAllah. But this is how much he wants to preserve the message. That whatever Allah is saying to me, I'm going to say that. Even if it's just a command, commandment to me to say something, I'm even going to add that commandment in. So here, it says, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ Say, He is Allah, the one, the alone. Now, the first thing that we can recognize from this uh, ayah is that Allah is the only God in existence. Anything else that you worship, it cannot be Allah. He is not two, he is not three, he is not a multitude. He is one. There cannot be anything more than the one. And the second ayah, it says, Allahu samad Allah, he is the eternal, the everlasting. He does not perish. He, ne he never had a beginning. He doesn't have an end. He is always existent, always present. Okay? He, is, he is what you can think of the past. He is in the present. He is of the future. But he is not of them. He, meaning he is not in them. That relative to us, we see things in the past. We th see things in the present. We see things in the future. But for Allah, there is, he, he's not limited by any of those things. He is everlasting. No beginning, no end. He is not limited by, by uh, space-time. And then it says, Lam yalid, Allah samad, Lam yalid wa lam yulad. That he does not beget meaning, he does not give birth, he does not uh, procreate. Wa lam yulad. And he was, he was never begotten. He never had a beginning. Okay, so this is in addition to the second ayah. Uh, and it's sort of speaking in a past tense voice, speaking for always, um, that he has never had anyone equal to him. There is no one that has ever been equal to him. Now, this surah, each ayah, is sort of links to the previous ayah. It's like a chain. And what it does is it starts off with Allah as the one. If you hear screaming in the background, my, my little brother's sort of going on one. Uh, so you'll have to excuse that. So it starts off with the oneness and then it moves into that this oneness it is always okay and what is this idea of always meaning that he never gives birth and he no one gave birth to him he never had a beginning he does not have an end okay he's always there this is what it means to be everlasting ever present eternal okay 
وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفْوًا أَحَدْ And that also means that there is no one else that is like that. He is alone in his qualities. That no one else can be like him. So this is to sort of target the polytheism, the paganism that was widespread in the Arabian Peninsula. And this paganism, it was not natural to the Arabs. Why is that? Because, see, the Arabs, at one time they were muahidun, meaning that they recognized the oneness of Allah. Okay? Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he built the house, the, uh, uh, the, the Kaaba, what did he intend for the house? He intended that people come to it to recognize the oneness of Allah, to worship him, to do pilgrimage for him, to sacrifice their lives for him. Okay? Not through suicide, as some people might understand, but in their work, their struggle, okay? their livelihood, that they, they str struggle for the sake of Allah. Okay, this is what was intended that someone comes from these people in, in Mecca and this person he recites to them the verses of your speech and he teaches them of the scripture and he teaches them wisdom and he purifies them. Okay, this is what was intended for this area and for a time, for a period. All these people, they were worshipping Allah as the one. But what happened? One person from the Arabs, they went to Greece and they recognised, or uh, they went to the Roman Empire, they went to, the, uh, you know, they saw that, they saw what the, yeah, I think it was in the time of the Greeks when they were still uh, dominant, that they saw the culture of this civilization. They saw all these idols and th that these idols represent civilization. Okay, that this, this uh, society has advanced. That they've moved on from this oneness. That they've become more complex, more developed into all these different idols. So they, he wanted to bring them back and show them this new idea. When he did, what happened? People started accepting that. And when people started accepting that, they started moving away from the fitra. That they were moving into something unnatural for them. And the revelation or the, the sending of the uh, Muhammad وسلم, that was to bring them back onto the path. It was all about the unity or the oneness of Allah. Okay. All these gods that are being put into the, uh, the Kaaba and how you can have all these pilgrims worshipping their own religion at the same time in this pilgrimage, this is an absurd idea that was not recognized by Ibrahim alayhi salam. This was not the purpose for the house. Okay, so this ayah is to come back to this fitra. Wallahu ahad. He is Allah, the one. He, meaning the one that we worship. Okay. Who is who? Uh, he. Okay. Who is he? He is our Lord. He is our creator. He is our sustainer. He is the almighty. He is the ever seeing, the ever hearing, the everlasting. Okay. And all this is of one deity. It cannot be split up. See, imagine that the Prophet and the revelation did not preach, did not teach about the oneness of Allah. Could you imagine that if we were to take these 99 names, we would fall into the same mistakes as the pagans? Imagine this. In Hinduism, they, so this is quite complex, but if you go into the deeper uh, parts of Hinduism, into yoga and everything, they do not talk about a multiplicity of gods. They all recognize a oneness. Okay? Yoga actually means, in Sanskrit, it means union, to uh, become unified with uh, 
reality. Everything is part of the one. It is only that where this idea of 33 million gods came from, that, um, that you can get back to that reality if you go through a specific uh, path. And this path will be your idol that you worship and then you go back to reality. And that everything is part of the one. Everything is sort of its, you know, it can be counted as uh, containing uh, uh, Godship. Okay, so this is this is the danger where you start to compare yourself to this Godship. If it was not for that teaching through Islam, even if Allah was teaching us about his 99 names, we could have still uh, fallen into that trap that we start separating the names. Okay. And there's this other one, other idea that thinking that Allah is of different parts. Okay. Qalu thalatha. Yeah. They say that he is of three. But say, no, he is one. And this is to understand that Allah is not s separated into parts. Okay. So one idea is that he's not, uh, that there's not different gods. That there is only one God, and the other idea is that He is not uh, He is not made put into parts. Okay, He is not of parts. Okay? He is not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Father, and the Holy Son. He is one, and this is where we can understand that He is something that is beyond imagination. He is something that has no beginning. He is something that has no end. Okay? How can you imagine something that has no beginning and has no end? And this is to help us understand that since there is no beginning and there is no end for Allah, He is beyond what we can imagine. That there is nothing like Him. Okay. Uh, that there is no one that is equal to Him. So, that there is nothing that is like Him. And funnily enough, straight after that, He says, basir." That he is the hearing, the the all hearing and the all seeing. Now, we could understand. Well, humans have hearing, and humans have seen. Okay, but with this verse, with these words just before this, well, he said, he said that there is nothing like him. That even his hearing is not like a hearing that you can understand. Even his seeing is not a seeing that you can, can understand. His sight is beyond what you can understand as sight. He sees everything in a way that you do not see. Meaning that even, even when you see the screen, you are not really seeing me. Okay, You are seeing a projection of me onto a screen. And even then, that is not complete because you cannot even see behind me. You cannot see inside of me. You cannot see what is behind the door, what is behind the walls. However, for Allah, that is nothing. These barriers are nothing for him. There is no limitation for what he can see. There is no limitation for what he can hear. Can you imagine all these vibrational frequencies in the air right now? And we can't even hear them because they're that subtle. Okay, And there's even, uh, there's even videos on YouTube showing what the sound what is the sound of the universe or what it sounds like in space and there's like a sort of gospelic chant that you can hear through the waves it's like an angelic chant that, I, that I can just be heard and um, this comes to show that there are things that we cannot hear which is beyond our hearing which is beyond our sight can you imagine that the Prophet وسلم, when he's sitting with his sahaba so casually he can see the affairs of the heavens in, in front of him and he can see what is happening in the graves. However, for the other Sahaba, they're just completely oblivious to that. But for the Prophet وسلم, it is just something very normal and he's not overwhelmed by that. He is still preaching his message and he's still saying he is in his own conscience. Allahu Akbar. So there are things beyond our hearing and beyond our sight. But can you imagine a type of sight that is beyond even creation itself. Okay, so Allah, He is not limited by anything, by any stretch of the imagination. You cannot 
even fathom what Allah is. And any depiction of what Allah is, that is not Allah. Okay, the Prophet وسلم, said that do not think about Allah. Okay, do not try to imagine Allah because what will happen is when you imagine him, you will create a picture. And this picture will be something that you recognize in this world from created things. And created things are not Allah. So the danger of trying to imagine Allah is that you will start to form a picture in your head. And whatever picture you form in your head, that is not Allah. And therefore you are worshipping anything other than Allah. Okay? Um, through your own imagination. And this, so he's, so the Prophet وسلم, says that if you want to remember Allah, if you want to recognize Allah, recognize him through his creation. Look at everything that he's given around us. This is to take us away from trying to go into that. Can you imagine that there was this one mathematician, uh, uh, his name was Kanto, I believe, that there is a speculation that he, he was someone that was trying to understand infinity. He was trying to understand infinity. And there is a speculation that he was focusing so hard on what infinity is that he, his mind cropped and he had to be put into a mental asylum. Can you imagine that? that trying to think about infinity and he, he just became so overwhelmed that, that his mind just cropped. It, there are people saying that, that this is not the case but anyway this can actually happen to a person when you're trying to think so much about Allah yeah, that you become so overwhelmed that you start breaking you could, you could go insane and this is why the, the shiuch they prescribe adhkar they prescribe uh, certain prayers so that we don't go overboard if we go overboard then we're going to be, we're going beyond what uh, we are uh, limited to yeah we are going beyond our capacity okay so Allah is eternal he is beyond imagination there is no beginning and no end no one has ever given birth to him and no one uh, uh, and he has never given birth to anyone and in one ayah Allah he sort of puts it as a question to, to us okay so if you do not think I created all of this think Understand this. You ask yourself this. Were you create? Did you were you created out of nothing, or did you create yourselves, or was there another cause for your creation? Okay, and you you could understand. Subhanallah. Allah even questions um, makes us question our logic. Okay, were we created from nothing? Well, <laughs> that cannot be the case. Look at everything around us. Everything comes from something. Okay, this goes into a sort of cosmological argument, but anyway, everything comes from something. Something. Okay, and also that for something to come out of absence into existence, it's it's it does not comp it does not uh, it cannot be understood scientifically, even. Okay, so how can you how do you even logically think that? It doesn't even come into your logic. So how do you even think that? Second thing, did you create yourselves? Well, this is what we call in logic, doubt, circular logic. Okay, and I don't want to go into that, but it's it's like, well, can you create your own self? Well, in order to create your own self, you already had to be present to create your own self. So, but if you're creating your own self, and you created, well. Where did your conscience come from to create your own self? And this, this goes on like a little spiral, uh, can mess about with people. But then there's, then you have to understand, you, you came from something else. And this cannot be from something below you. Have you ever seen a child giving birth to their parent? No. So it had to be something higher. And this cause that is higher than us, it has to be something beyond even creation itself. And this is something that is more spiritual than it is logical. And just to skip a few things. Um, there is no, so, uh, no one equal to him and I'm using many Quranic verses because it's all the proof that you, you need for this like I said this, this, uh, this surah pretty much covers the whole Quran in, in one sense the, uh, or a third of the Quran like it's mentioned 
لو كان فيهما آلهة إلا الله لا فسدتا. But if there were two gods taking a, uh, uh, if there were two gods, two deities, um, or if you could, or if there was another god other than Allah, لا فسدتا. The heavens and the earth would be crushed, demolished. And this is like, how can you have two supreme powers? If one goes against the other, what will happen? Complete and utter chaos. And um, Imam al Jawaini, uh, Imam al Harmain al Jawaini, the teacher of Imam al Ghazali, he makes an argument that if you, if if there were two gods, and two of them, both of them disagreed, and one of them wins over the other, the other one will have to sort of, you know, walk walk away, and the one that walks away cannot be classed as a god, and therefore you still have one god in the end. Okay? <laughs> Meaning that Allah has to be someone that is beyond anyone's power. There can no one that can match him. No god, no other god that can match him. No idol can match him. So this is to recognize his oneness. And um, we also talked about Tawheed, that Tawheed is to recognize everything comes from Allah. And to worship Allah as the one. There is nothing other that we can worship, not even our own nafs, which is the biggest corruption of this modern world, even worse than what we've had so far. Uh, people were worshipping idols, but it was still something that they thought as high than themselves, even though they were worshipping their own nafs, but or some of them and some of them just didn't have enough knowledge where they were worshipping idols. But now we've come into an uh, an era where we're worshipping identity, we're worshipping the ego, we're worshipping the nafs, and this is a uh, very very bad bad corruption that is plaguing the earth okay so we have to recognize that allah is the one he is the one we worship beyond our own nafs okay he is the only one that we worship and that he is the cause he you know to try and see him in everything in all of creation he is the one and uh, i just want to end it on one quote by martin links where he says in the seer, his seer of the Prophet Muhammad he is describing the, he is def, defining harmony and he says that harmony is the imprint of oneness upon multiplicity and I will end it there does anyone have any questions how much time do we have by the way no questions how much time do you have left Three minutes. Um, does anyone have any comments, questions, uh, anything that they need more clarity on? Um, yes, yeah, just a reminder on um, when you mentioned the saying, uh, I'm not sure if it's from the hadith, um, not to ponder about the not to ponder about the existence of Allah, rather um, the creation of Allah. Uh, do you know the exact wording? In Arabic, if that's okay. Uh, I remember um, uh, my teacher talking to us about it, but um, and I know there is a hadith uh, somewhere. I, I remember reading it, but I can't remember the exact wording. Uh, I don't, this was something I don't that was, um, this was something that was taught to me as well when I when I was studying Aqidah. Uh, my Ustad said this, but he did, uh, I can't remember him saying if it was a hadith or not. But is this a common saying in uh, Arabic anyway? Uh, yeah, I remember. I remember um, being said it was a hadith. But um, if 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 it is not, then I'd I'd have to do research on that. Exactly. Um, any other questions? No. I mean, inshallah, there's another two days, so Sheikh Asif will be explaining more, and um, we will also have a, a guest speaker as well. So um, there's much more to come on the surah as well. Uh, inshallah, if you if you still have questions on the surah, um, you can ask us, uh, tomorrow and the next day after that, or um, you know any other time. But inshallah, there will be more explanation on the surah. There's a lot of, lot to cover with the surah, especially when it comes to Allah. Like I said, he is not limited by anything. Therefore, we cannot limit explanation. Yeah. So, exactly. 